Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 604-MR-530 from the official files of Scotland Yard. Leo M. Stefanovich, former member of the Polish Navy. Yes, I deserted the Navy. Marian Konieczki, who had fought in Spain. What I am interested in is money. Kazimir Kashuba, <laughs> who was found dead. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc. It's a living... Superintendent Alistair Watkins of Scotland Yard. I must warn you that if you expect high adventure in Limehouse or sinister orientals lurking in dark byways, you'd best turn off your wireless now. We're quite ordinary people at Scotland Yard. Professional policemen, catchers of criminals, and we don't go in much for the picturesque, the way we are sometimes pictured. However, if you'd like to see how we proceed upon a case, I'll ask you to step inside our black museum and... Meet the man in charge of it. Come in. This is Chief Inspector John Davidson, who's in charge here. Well, how do you do? I'm afraid that the so-called Black Museum is neither black nor a museum, nor is it a grand guignol. We have here a large number of guns, knives, other weapons which have been used in crimes. We have also disguises, clothing, exhibits of all sorts that have helped in solving many of these crimes. I think you ought to explain, John, why we keep these gruesome relics. Yes, indeed. They're here for a purpose quite removed from idle curiosity. They're principally for the use of the men of Scotland Yard in studying crime techniques and exemplars of crime methods. They bring to life the cold words contained in our files and are most useful as well as graphic. For example... In this case, Superintendent Watkins is reenacting for you. Now, this is a bullet that killed a man. It was fired from this gun. 32 caliber Waltham automatic pistol. And it was Scotland Yard's job to prove that. And this, the top of an ordinary mechanical pencil. This is a very important bit of evidence. Just a cheap little metal pencil. It wasn't cheap for the man who lost it, John. Well, it cost him his life, you see. We were standing in the corner of a saloon bar in Whitechapel, talking. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc, and me. I expect you don't know what a narc is. N-A-R-K. In America, I think you call him a stool pigeon. Every detective in the world has his pet narc, and Albert Stevens was mine. It was an insignificant place we were in, and Albert Stevens, two mild and bitters, had set him talking sixteen to the dozen. I don't suppose you'd know him by sight, sir. But I could tell you how to find them. That is, I've seen them about here and there. It's American cigarettes they're handing now. But they ain't got many left. And when they're sold out of them, they'll try something else. Have you got any ideas of it? No, sir, not yet. But it'll be something big, I'm sure of that. Do they know you, do you suppose? <laughs> Nobody notices a taxi driver, sir. They've rode in my cab twice now. And they've never even looked at my face. But uh, I've looked at them. Will you have another mild and better, Albert? Well, I wouldn't say no, sir. Here, miss. Fill this up here, will you, again? Will you? Thank you. They're some kind of foreigners, sir, they are. Uh, thank you, miss. Uh, this I know. They're in the black market up to here. You said that. What kind of foreigners? Mm, I can't understand them much. Except when they talk about, well, what they think is English. Greeks or Spaniards or Russians, I think. All three of them. Oh, they tip quite nice, too. 
But uh, you're sure they're in the black market? No doubt about it, sir. I hear enough about it. Don't know their names. Well, one is called Marion. Marion? And the other's name is Kashmir. Kashmir. <laughs> Maybe he's an Hindu. And the other is a gentleman in some kind of navy, sir. Not ours. Some foreign navy. He wears a uniform. Who seems to be the boss? Well, I'd say this year Kashmir is, sir. Cool. He, he's an odd man, he is, sir. Is that all you know about them, then? That's all I know right now, sir. Well, ain't that worth three pints a mild and bitter, sir? Yeah, just about, Albert. Well, I was sort of hoping you'd have a spare ten shilling note on you, sir. I have, Albert, but not for you, my lad. When you've something better than a comic trio of foreigners who gibber about American cigarettes, maybe, but not till then. Would you like to buy a magnificent new solid gold mechanical pencil, sir? Here, here, here. A sacrifice for ten shillings. <laughs> Where'd you get it? A lady gave it to me, sir. Now, what say? Say seven and six to you, sir. Come now, Albert. You know that's worth all of ninepence. Ninepence, then, sir. I need the money. Come off it, Albert. Well, then, sir. What? What? What did you say if I told you these foreign blokes is murderers? Shouldn't believe a word of it. Well, they might be, sir. Well, when you can prove it, come round and see me, Albert. Well, don't I get another pint, sir? Uh, here, miss. Another of the same for my friend here. Night, Albert. At Scotland Yard next morning, I walk leisurely down the long corridor on the second floor that leads to my office. A voice hailed me as I opened the door to my office, and I looked back. It was Detective Sergeant Llewellyn, a Welshman who had been a constable at the Water Street Police Station when I was a sergeant. Here was a welcome face. David, I said, I've not seen you in six months. Longer than that, indeed, Superintendent. It's ten months, and I'm very glad to be seeing you. Where have you been? To the Army all this time, sir. I was seconded to MI5. Yes, yes, I heard it that. It was tiresome work, but now I'm back, thanks indeed to the Lord. <laughs> Taking a well-earned rest, I expect. Oh, indeed, to goodness, no. There's no rest for the wicked. <laughs> I'm on a case already. Can we have dinner this evening, then? I'm not so sure, sir. What have they given you? Oh, a murder. Good bloody one? I've just seen the man. He's bloody enough, indeed. They found him shot to death in his car early this morning. Where? Chepstow Place, Notting Hill. The constable who found him in his car, parked beside the curb, thought he was taken with drink and found <laughs> asleep. But it was a thirty-two caliber bullet okay. in the back of his neck and out the front of his head. Very gory. Know who he was? A foreigner, it seems, with the name of Casimir Kersuba. Oh, Whatever is the matter, then? Do you know him? Come on in my room here. I don't know the chap, but I have an idea I know someone who does. Well, indeed, to goodness. Come on in. Come on in while I telephone. I've got his number in my book here. At least a number where I can reach him. Ah, here it is. Whoever is he, Superintendent? A chap named Albert Stevens, a narc. Talking to him just last night. Mentioned a chap named Kashmir, he called him. Foreigner. <laughs> just might be. Now, where is the beggar? Every little bit. Yes, who is it? Oh, oh, hello. Is Albert there? Albert Stevens? Yes, he has been home since yesterday morning. Who wants him? When he comes in, tell him to telephone Watkins. Watkins, got that? Hoskins? Watkins. W-A-T-K-I-N-S. He knows me. What do you want? Just tell him to call me, that's all. Does he know where to call? Yes, it's very important. Do you understand? He ain't come home since yesterday morning. All right, have him telephone me at once. You needn't shout at me, Mr. Bloody Will Watkins. Goodbye. Out there. No, telephone me. I say, where can I reach you? Oh, I've got all this report on the man to write up, for goodness sake. I'll be in my office till noon. Oh, he'll telephone me before that, I'm sure. Well, I must be going, sir. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't reach him just now. But I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from him. I'll be very grateful to you, sir. It was good seeing you again. Been a long time, Llewellyn. Well, goodbye. So long. So long, old chap. Oh, you dropped something. Eh? Hey, where? There on the floor, beside your right foot. Oh, what's the floor of this? What is it? I found it in the car with the dead man. Huh? A top off a cheap mechanical pencil. Let's see it. Do you mind? <laughs> 
Not at all. Don't have to be careful of fingerprints. They've had it in the laboratory. Nothing on it. That's it. Beg your pardon, sir. I've seen this pencil before, Lou. Oh, millions of them about, no doubt. The chap that was killed must have lost it. No. Eh? I've seen this particular one before. I saw it last night. I don't follow you, sir. <laughs> that settles it. Look here closely. Yes. See these initials scratched on it? Very tiny here. Probably done with a pocket knife. See it? A.S. By crikey, A.S., that's what they are. Whose do you suppose? Uh, he offered to sell it to me last night. Who? Albert Stevens, the copper's knock. I was just trying to telephone. Goodness sake. So that's why he hasn't come home. Eh? He said he knew this Casimir. He said Casimir had money. And money was what he needed. Oh, well, Casimir was robbed, we know that. But I never knew a copper's knock to have the courage to commit murder, sir. <laughs> why, I... I bought him the courage, old boy. Four pints of mild and bitter. Suppose that makes me an accessory to murder? The constables who were dispatched to the home of Albert Stevens reported that he was still absent. At 11 the next morning, he had not yet come home. His wife knew nothing of his whereabouts, nor did the garage people where he usually kept his cab. At noon, a teletype signal was sent to all metropolitan police stations giving a description of the man and the number of his cab, GLP-301. The same information was published next day in Metropolitan Informations, which goes to all police officers. There was no immediate response. Neither the man nor the cab could be found. By now, Superintendent Watkins had been officially assigned to the case, and on the morning of the fourth day, we held a strategy meeting in his office. He had some new information for me. They found the gun. Indeed, sir. They've been taking the car to pieces down at Hendon for us, you know. They found a thirty-two caliber Walther automatic pistol hidden in the lining of the top. Good. Our friend Casimir was killed by a thirty-two caliber bullet, you know. And ballistics assures me that this is the gun from which it was fired. Good. Fingerprints? What? Fingerprints? None. The ballistics say they're sure that more than one shot was fired from the gun. How could they tell that? If there... There are two cartridges missing from the clip. And it seems they found too much powder fouling in the receiver and the barrel for one shot. I, I don't quite understand, but they're quite positive. They find more than one bullet? Only the one that went through Casimir's head it was embedded in the dash of the car. Where's this other one, then? Somebody else's body, I expect. Hmm. But whose, I say? Yes. Oh, blast. Superintendent Watkins, him. Hi, Watkins. Fletcher Air, T Division. Hello, Sailor. Okay, we found your man, Albert Stevens. Oh, good. Found him. Oh. Where was he? Sitting in his taxi cab. Where? At the bottom of the Thames. What? The whapping old stairs. One of our boats found him. Is he dead? Twice dead, old chap. Drowned and a bullet through his heart. Well, so that's where the other bullet went. <laughs> I admit I'd more or less dropped a brick in pinning all my hopes of a quick solution of the case on Albert Stevens. Llewellyn and I moved at once to realign our strategy. This was our estimate of the situation. It is possible that Stevens did murder Casimir, of course. Uh, possible, but not probable. The forensic laboratory people, the ballistics people, say that the bullet they found in Stevens' body was fired from the same gun that killed Casimir. The thirty-two Walther automatic they found in the car. But then, who killed who? Uh, I suspect that since the gun was found in the car with Casimir, he was the last one shot, wouldn't you? Well, then, of course, Stevens couldn't have killed him. Right. Stevens must have been dead and at the bottom of the Thames when Casimir was shot. Then, who killed Casimir? Obviously not Stevens. The forensic laboratory can tell us who died first, I hope. We know. How? The gun. It was with Casimir, remember? Unless someone shot him, then took the gun and killed Stevens with it, pushed him into the Thames, and then brought the gun back. Sounds silly. Indeed. Then who shot Casimir? One of Stevens' friends might have, if he knew Casimir killed Stevens. Revenge. 
How do we know Casimir shot Stevens? Well, we... Besides, Stevens didn't have any friends. Except me. And I don't think I did it. His wife, perhaps? Yeah. Perhaps. Well, besides, how could she get that gun? Hmm. No friends. None I know of. I knew Albert rather well. Ha. Huh. What? Casimir had friends, though. Albert told me about them. Who? A man named, um, woman's name, um, uh, Marion. I don't know her. Him. And a man who wears a foreign Navy uniform. Polish? Casimir was Polish. And a deserter. I suspect our man's a deserter, too. They were all mixed up in the black market, Albert said. What sort of black market, sir? Oh, all sorts, it appears. Why should they kill Casimir? And, or Albert Stevens? Well, Albert, that's simple. They found out he was an informer. A narc. Why Casimir? Oh, people have been murdered for money before. Perhaps Casimir was cheating them. He was apparently the boss. Well, a crook who cheats a fellow crook is asking for it. Let's get on to Marion and the Navy officer. All we have to do is find them. Now, allow me to digress for a moment. There was, of course, no record anywhere of Casimir's former address. We put people on that at once, suspecting that Marion and the Navy officer might live close to Casimir's home. But another day dragged by without tangible result. I was sitting gloomily in my office, trying to think of a more tenable theory than the one we had tentatively adopted. Oh, bless the phone. Yes, Watkins here. Glad to see you, sir. Inspector. What's her name? Name, please. Miss Dottie Telfer. Spell it, please. T-A-L-I-A-S-E-R-R-O. You've heard of me. I'm the actress. Miss Dottie Telfer, sir. And... Actress! You know me. Actress, sir. What she want? She says it's in connection with Casimir... What was her name, miss? Cashubert, I said. I heard her. Yes, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. And ask Sergeant Llewellyn if you'll just step in here. Yes, sir. Come in. Good afternoon, madam. Are you Superintendent Watkins? I am. Sit down, madam. I thank you. You said you knew something about Casimir Kashuba. Yes, yeah, I saw him the express that he's dead. Extremely. And good enough for him, I'd say. You knew him? Yes. He was a crook. I'm afraid you're rather late in telling us that, madam. Well, I mean to say I... Uh, what uh, sort of dealings did you have with him? Well, I never had any. Well, I mean, he cheated me, and now he's dead. How am I going to get back the 17 pounds I gave him? That's what I want to know. Why did you give him 17 pounds? Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, come on in, Llewellyn. This is Miss Dottie... Yes, sir. I'm a music hall star at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. How do you do, madam? Sit down, Llewellyn. Seems Miss Telfer has given Casimir 17 pounds. Whatever for, miss? Well, it was rather silly of me, but I couldn't resist it. Resist what? Well, I was having a, a late supper after the show last Tuesday, and there was a man, Kashmir Kashuba, it turned out to be, sitting two tables away from me. Is that the first time you met him? Of course. Do you think mm. that... Uh, on the table before him was the most magnificent handbag. Handbag? A woman's handbag, the kind I hadn't seen for simply years. I couldn't resist doing what I did. What did you do, madam? <laughs> oh, I know it's breaking the law, but isn't everyone in the black market? Not everyone exactly. I? Oh, well... I just stepped over to the table and introduced myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, Would you mind terribly telling me where you got that adorable bag? I wanted one myself, you know. Black market. So he said he manufactured them, and that I could have one if I liked. All I had to do was to give him 17 pounds, so that he could buy the special leather it was made of, and in a day or two, I could call at his flat... And it would be ready for me, do you see? And you fell for that old one. You called at his flat. Would you believe it? When I called, 
He professed never having seen me. He said he was not a manufacturer. He wasn't. And nothing I could say would make him give me back my 17 pounds or the bag. And did you kill him then? I did not. Later, perhaps. I never killed anyone in my life. I'm a law-abiding... Will you give us the address, my dear law-abiding young woman? Well, it's in Maida Vale somewhere. I think I have it here, in my shabby old handbag. Thank you very much, Miss... Telfer, an, an actress. An actress, I think you said, yes. Hmm. Well, uh, that'll be all, Miss Telfer, and thank you very much. Come along, Llewellyn. Right. Yes, but how am I going to get my 17 pounds back? The man's dead You're now. not going to get it back, Miss Telfer. What? You're very fortunate. The black markets cost you only 17 pounds. It cost Casimir's life. Ready, Llewellyn? Within 20 minutes, a Scotland Yard car dropped us at the address in Maida Vale Miss Telfer, actress, had supplied us. We interviewed the proprietor of that dismal place, a cross-eyed young man in an unusually dirty waistcoat in the red Mingus tartan. His name, he informed us, was Ian Kalbfleisch, and he had a cold. No, he ain't here. We're quite aware of that, my good man. He's dead. Did you murder him? No. Are you in the black market, too? No. May we see his room? Say this, Eddie Boy. Whose is it, then? Another man. Who? An officer. <laughs> Navy officer. Oh? RN? RNR? Or RNVR? Not one of ours. <clears throat> Polish Navy. When did this Polish naval officer take the room, Mr. Kalbflash? Day after the murder. Oh, you know the day of the murder, then? I can read. <laughs> Was it all the papers? Is this man here now? No. Will he return? He always has. Was this naval officer a friend of Casimir's? I don't know. May we see the room? Got a warrant? Yes. All right. <laughs> Second door on the left. Come on, Lou. All right. It's unlocked. Come on. No, leave the door open, Lou. Our friend with a runny nose might just warn him that we're here. Right. I'll keep watch. While Llewellyn kept watch from the open door... I made a quick search of the place. I found nothing at all of any apparent importance until I went through the pockets of the navy greatcoat in the closet. I was about to exhibit my findings to Llewellyn when he hissed sharply at me from the doorway. What's up? Chap coming in, wearing a navy uniform. People in your room, Commander. Who are they? To me. Cutler Yard. What do they want? If you'll come in, Commander, we'll be glad to tell you. Who are you? Sergeant Llewellyn of Scotland Yard. I think you'd best come in, sir. Come in, sir. What, what is the meaning of this, may I ask? What is your name, please? Leo M. Stefanowitz, Commander of Polish Navy. What do you want? I should like to ask you a question. Well... May I ask you where you got this mechanical pencil, sir? Uh, I will tell you. I got it, uh... Well, uh, where did you get it? I didn't kill him. Kill whom, Commander? Why, Kasimir Kashuba. Uh, this was Albert Stevens' pencil, Commander. I didn't kill Albert. The top of this pencil was found in the car with Kasimir Kashuba's body, Commander. I didn't do it. Perhaps you can explain, then. Yes, I... Well... Uh, Marion did the killing. Oh, indeed, Marion. Uh, yes, I, I told him not. Uh, it was Marion who did it, uh, not me. Oh, our friend Marion, he did it. Hmm. Yes, I am telling you the truth. Marion. You know where Marion is? I will take it to him. Yes, I, I will help you. He did it, and I will help you find him. Uh, please, uh, let me please, take you to him. Please. Will you please? Casimir was my friend. I'm just wondering something, Inspector. Huh? Eh? Uh -huh. I am wondering if Albert Stevens was also his friend. Let's go and find your friend Marion, shall we, Commander? It was a quiet little hotel we drove to in the West End. Inspector Watkins and me and the Commander all jammed in the police car together. 
The clerk nodded in a familiar way to Stefanovitz when we entered. Is my friend in? Yes, sir. Oh, don't announce us, please. We will work the lift ourselves. Uh, get in, gentlemen. All right. Uh, now, we shall see justice done. Indeed. The first floor, gentlemen. Uh, the door directly opposite. Uh, here. Who is he? Uh, Leo, Marion. Who is with you? No one. Come in. Ah, Leo, my boy, I am glad... We are from I... Scotland Yard, sir. I warn you, both of you, that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. What is the meaning of you, this? murderer? What? Yes, these gentlemen have come to arrest you for the murder of Casimir. Sacred, you, you traitor, you, you, you coward. Arrest him, gentlemen. He is the murderer. You, 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 look, look, these men. He's the one who fired shot. Huh? He's the one who did it. I, I see him do it. You see me? You know you did it. He's I, the one, I'm gentlemen. not. I'm not. He should catch me from behind as I sit in front seat. I was in the front seat. He did it. Shut up. Oh, talk. Talk for you, sir. You thief, you. Gentlemen, you. gentlemen. You. gentlemen. Marian Konechny and Leo Stefanovic, I arrest you both on suspicion of having been involved in the murder of Casimir Kasuba. And of Albert Stevens. You've both been warned. Have you nothing to say? At the trial, the two men admitted all the details of the two murders. Albert Stevens, it seems, had talked too much about his relations with the police, and someone in a moment of rage had shot him and his cab had been dumped into the Thames. Walking away from there together, they'd stolen a motor car. Casimir Kashubo, who had been drinking heavily, twitted his companions about the new hold he had on them as murderers. He boasted that he'd had no part in the crime, and one of the two men had shot him in the back of the neck with a Walther automatic pistol. Each man blamed the other. The jury took 25 minutes to decide who was guilty. Mr. Justice McConaughey placed the black cap on his head. Marian Konyatsny, Leo Stavarovich. The jury have found you and each of you guilty of the murder of Kasima Kashuba. It is the sentence of the court that you and each of you be taken to a lawful prison and fetched to a place of execution. Let you be there, each of you, hanged by the neck until you are dead. Let your bodies respectfully... The two men appealed the verdict and won. They were immediately tried for the murder of Albert Stevens and again heard the fatal words... That you there, each of you, be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The latter sentence was carried out. the eighth in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed, otherwise the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Jack Goldstein and Collie Small. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure zooming your way today with Joel McRae featured in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs>